Hey guys, this is Hell Hades. This is a Watcher of Realms video, and today we are joined by the goat of Watcher of Realms. We have got my bucket in the house. Dude, how you doing? Thanks so much for having me, mate. I'm doing very good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, really good. Like, it's a pleasure to have you on. For those who don't pleasure know, you. like basically this, this guy has been making Watcher of Realms content really before it was even out there. <laughs> so, so I guess, I mean, Quite how long have you been playing for? Uh, I think... I think I'm nearly coming up to a year on the dot. I think in about three weeks' time, I'll be at a year. So quite a while now. And, and obviously, like, Global Launch was only a couple of months back. So you were playing on, on what's called the, the Forerunner server? Yeah, yeah. The Forerunner was, like, these exclusive uh, servers that were open specific regions. So I think the main player, player base were Russia, Canada, and the UK. So that's obviously how I, I got on early. But, sure. yeah, so quite a small audience, but it's quite fun. Nice yeah. to get a little bit of a head start on knowledge. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, I actually had a like promotion through my raid channel on Watcher of Realms before that. So it was probably about 18 months to two years ago. They approached me and said, will we play a game and just do like a 10 hour play test and then just give us some feedback? So, and I did it. It was, cool. it, was, it was quite a fun thing to do actually. And the game looked very different to this. I wish I still had like some, some visuals of it because you know, some of the stuff we were feeding back is like, you know, the, the campaign doesn't feel good. The, the uh, interaction between some of the champions doesn't really make sense. And like, it has changed a lot. And obviously enough for me to, to actually love playing the game and want to do a channel on it. So, so that's super cool. Yeah, I'd heard about that. I, I never actually saw it myself, but there were people who were saying the game had a different name before and it was, it was quite different. But yeah, it's obviously changed quite a lot. And uh, it's fantastic that you've joined the community as well. I know that a lot of people are very excited about that. So ah, cool. awesome to well, have you here. I guess, I guess for today, so we're going to be talking all things Guild Boss. I'm going to be trying to suck out the knowledge and, um, and help you guys out in terms of building teams, in terms of great champions, in terms of positioning on a, a Guild Boss kind of setup. So I guess maybe that's where we start, if, if that's cool with you, in, in terms yeah, of trying to, to kind of come up with the right type of teams. I've recently started to uh, one key, a one shot Nightmare 2, and then... Um, nice. I got my my best Nightmare Three hit yesterday, which was quite quite uh, excitable. Yeah, I saw that. It. It's a good video. <laughs> oh, cool! Getting a lot of uh, value out of some very strong Nightmare heroes, which is probably going to be a big focus of this video, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess in terms of team comp and positioning, so talk us through what what you're looking for. You know, if you're if you're kind of like setting out the the basics of what you would put into a team. Are you yeah. a one healer guy? Are you a two healer guy? Um, yeah, you know, so there's... Fighters versus majors. Let's just kind of get a bit of a, a rough feel for what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, any ideal team has a Dolores. I think that's probably one of the few blanket statements you can make. Yeah. Dolores is just too effective and too powerful at what she does to substitute with basically anything else at the moment. Okay. So it, every team just, just builds on that, around a Dolores. Cause... I, I'm not aware, but is there a legendary champion that does the same steal that Dolores does? Not on global yet, but right. there are actually two coming. There is Fursi and Constance. Fursi is like a lizard man healer, and yeah. Constance is like a, a holy paladin defender. And they both offer the same, I think it's called inspiration now. It's like an attack boosting buff. Yeah. However, from my testing on the test server, they don't apply as much as Dolores does. So there's, at least right. she's not being power creep. She's still going to yeah. be incredible for as long as we play from the looks of things. But and, they'll offer slightly do you different feel like ways she's... of playing it and they'll make different teams possible. So that could be kind of cool. Okay. And do you, do you think she's just straight overpowered for an epic or are we not in that place? Yeah, I, I, think, I, think, it's, I think we have to say so. Yeah, <laughs> I think she is. <laughs> she's, uh, yeah. She, so so she's... you need Dolores for. So it's, I think, yeah, yeah. I think she's, she's way over tuned. She's, she should just be part of the default account at this point. <laughs> Yeah, she's um, and the other thing that surprises me, like she's five cost. You know, it's yeah. super cheap for yeah. a really strong hero. Like she's it's just like, I'll just so throw it down so it easy. As well. Yeah. Uh, so Dolores, where where would be your like ideal position for a Dolores then? So I think the same places where you put her. Just yeah, exactly there. That's where I tend to put her because it offers you five tiles option around her on the um, platforms, and it offers you free ground tiles. Yeah. So it's the mainly it's the ground tiles. It's the best position to place her to get the most ground tiles covered. So you have free fighters within her attack boost. 
and then you can feel the rest of your tiles on the ground and every single hero is covered so yeah that is yeah. that side or the right side whichever your preference is is the ideal place for all dolores yeah and i've seen another healer which is an epic i want to say she's called nisande but i could be wrong on the name yeah is that right yeah yeah i believe so the yeah attack boosting healer yeah so is she boosting. is she a decent alternative if you don't have this uh dolores in terms of like a buffer a boost in damage but not to the same level obviously yeah she she boosts attack speed so that is very nice and people used to use her a lot in the past like uh when we were still figuring stuff out on the forerunner server she was really quite popular yeah but it's i mean if you don't have dolores you don't have dolores there's not a lot you can do about it so yeah i guess at that point she's she's a, she's a pretty good option to use alongside hollow is another epic healer so yeah. it was quite common in the back in the day I should, to use both of them at the same time to get a rage regen boosting healer and an attack speed boosting healer. Okay. And so but, Dolores, yeah, so would, think... would you would you class Dolores as an actual healer? Like, do we get enough healing out of her for that to be no. relevant or I mean, more support? She, yeah, she's a, she's a horrendous healer. The game's healing scaling mechanics, there's like a modifier, a secret modifier that depends on the type of healer. So regardless of her stats, her actual end healing, it, it's like 0.1 because of, well, it's like multiplied by 0.1 because she's an AoE healer. Right. Whereas a single target healer, I believe it's like point, I think it's like just one. So they get 100% of their heal value. Okay. It's, it's something like that. But basically AoE healers get their healing massively reduced by some hidden artificial number somewhere. So yeah, okay. she, her healing output is very, very minor. You In the past, I've actually run teams with just her as the healer. And it yep. just about worked, even at Nightmare 4. But that's dependent on pretty good gear, pretty ideal heroes, some that can self-sustain. Uh, but generally, we use Rage Boosters. I have a Hollow or Elowin make a really, really big difference on a, a Guild Boss team. And even a Sande with the Attack Speed Boost would make would be good enough that you would rather take her over taking another damage dealer. Yeah. So for me, then, I, I use currently Vortex or Medan as my kind of like two options of healers. And in fact... For the run I did yesterday, I used both Dolor I used Dolores and then I used both of these as healers. Do you mm. think that's overkill or is that is, is, it's is that not quite ideal, common? But sometimes you've got to do it, right? It, it depends what your options are. So what I would probably do is try with Midan underneath Dolores facing up, and then yeah. there's one fighter tile not covered on the right, right? Yes. So I would put an A5 Wrath there. And if it works out, then sometimes his ult comes up and he keeps himself alive. Sure. So, so mine's not A5, but path. someone yeah. did shout out to me yesterday that I should be actually throwing Valeria outside of like healing because she gets a lot of damage boost from being low health. Yeah, but so long as you can heal her afterwards is the, the yeah. This thing. is this is what I was going to say. Like, so how does that work? Because I don't know how I'm healing her. So I don't have like a <laughs> heal mechanic on it or anything. So I think a lot of those teams are assuming you have an Elowin is my assumption. Because when I've used her on the test server, that's exactly how I did it. I put her exactly there. Where yeah. your Midan is, I had Elowin. And when Elowin ults, her healing range increases a little bit on the wings. Right. And so okay. her ult will cover Valeria. And she also has her Wood Elves that she can place to heal. So she has ways of healing in burst sometimes, which is really ideal with Valeria. Yeah. So, so if you had, you know, basically any champion in the game, uh, we talked about Medan being a good option here. You said Hollow's a good option as well. Um, what about the kind of legendaries? That, is, are the legendaries you'd be picking over those for your boss if you got them? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Pro definitely. <laughs> you yeah. definitely have Dolores still in, in where she is right now. And you'd have Valeria where she is right now. But instead of Medan, I would have an Elowin facing up because she yeah. passively grants to everyone on the map rage regen and at max skill up on her passive it is one percent of their rage cap per second for everyone regardless of if they're right. in her range or not so it's just oh, such an insane boost yeah okay so so we're then gonna say generally we'd have what three fighters or is that just dependent on what what heroes you've got ideally three fighters yeah just so they're all inside the dolores boost yeah so we could have one i, I use one here and then I popped one at the front line. Yeah. Obviously, things like, I guess, things to call out. Dolores currently is wearing an artifact which gains attack. I think if she's standing next to someone. So, um, and Tesla teachings, I guess? Yes, yes. So you just need to I be see. aware of things like that. Are, are there other artifacts that work in the same sort of way where you have to be like, connected to someone? Is that generally a vibe or is that a, a one-off? 
There's a couple of healing ones that are legendary that have similar mechanics, but they're not very good, so no one really uses them. Yeah. So it doesn't really come up too much, fortunately. Okay. And then obviously, I mean, for me, I'm lucky to have a set ram who can just go at the back and it's got yeah. absurd range. Um, He's real good. I, do, do we have other... I guess there must be other heroes that still fill the spot pretty comfortably. Yeah, there's, there's of... a whole bunch of marksmen that hit the corners as well, and that's what makes them easy to use in that position. So Silas, for example, I believe hits the corners, so does Hex. So yeah. they're both pretty good in that situation. Okay. And then, I guess after that, you've then got, what, I guess two other damage dealers, ideally, or perhaps one healer and one other damage dealer that are going to kind of fill your roster. Yeah, I mean, I would try for just two more damage dealers because vortex is not providing any damage increase but if you need him you yeah. need him so it depends sure. what you can get away with i think the, the biggest issue you'll, you'll have at the moment is valeria's outside of, of the hill range for midan but yes. um aside yeah. from that yeah you you would i guess it depends on if, if if you know that you can't make it work without vortex and vortex goes down and then at the moment you don't have any magic damage i believe so i would probably use Karmet over ajax but it depends on your gearing and what you've got so yeah maybe we but, could but, take but a look the, at the rest for the of average the player for the average player would would you say mix up magic damage and, and fighter damage does does that matter or is it just kind of like bring in whatever's gonna pump the most damage yeah it's it's a good question i think ideally it would be great if we could synergize around a single type of damage but once you're pushing towards a stronger team, so maybe this isn't relevant to a lot of average players, but a lot of people rely heavily on Zilla too, and she does magic damage as a fighter, but her damage okay. is so excessive that it's hard to ignore it. So we yeah. can't build entirely around one damage type or the other. But Cause I, Yeah, because I know we were talking uh, before we came, before we started recording, and I've got a couple of units. Let's just come out of here a second. So yep. I've got a couple of units which have the ability to reduce either the resistances of the the boss or or enhance our damage and certainly when i come from raid shadow legends it's very very obvious like this ability drops the enemy's defense by 60 percent. <laughs> this ability weakens the, the enemy so you do more damage like so it's very easy to say you should bring a hero that does that into your squad yeah but i feel like in this game it's not quite as easy um, yeah, I don't know why, but the, the tooltips in this game are atrocious, it has to be said. It's it's very messy, the wording on so many things, so it's very difficult to... You see vulnerability and, and magic resistance down, and it's not super clear the, the exact difference behind how it works and what you actually get out of it. Yeah, because I've got Ajax here, who I thought, well, bring him in, because he's actually bringing a passive that reduces the magic resistance of the enemy, as long as I'm within a close range. So I was thinking... Great. If I bring him in, then maybe I should focus around magic damage yeah. rather than uh, focus around you know, physical damage. But then <laughs> I've also got Valeria here, who has got vulnerability, yeah. um, dealing dealing uh, dealing damage and inflicting vulnerability. Like, does this increase everybody's damage or just her damage? Is is a question. Everyone who's dealing physical damage, yeah. She will increase everybody's damage that's doing physical damage. Yeah, the boss okay. will have a little... Uh, that, that particular shield cleaved icon will be under yeah. the boss. Um, but yeah, it's for every single ally who's dealing physical damage. And then I did see a, a Murder, Inc. video, which was uh, very interesting a couple of days ago, where Mary, who's uh, kind of like freebie, does vulnerability for both physical and magic damage, but it's a smaller amount. It's... It's basically yeah, a 10 yeah, it's a good video. Game. It's um, hmm. as you say, it's a smaller amount. A max skill ups is twenty percent, so it's similar to the oh, others. Oh, okay, but, right, yeah. But it does, it, they won't stack, so it's going to only take the best one you've got applied. And if you already have a Valeria applying the physical vulnerability, Valeria is also doing a monstrous amount of damage. So you wouldn't really want to use Mary. Mary's no. potentially quite good if you don't have other ways of applying vulnerability, because obviously, ideally, you want your heroes to contribute damage as well and she's she's not going to but she's a good option if you don't have someone applying those debuffs yeah but would you say you do definitely want somebody in your squad ideally that's going to apply these debuffs i think it's i would i'm not sure as a, a blanket statement i think most likely yeah but i i haven't tested exactly it depends on your lineup which ones you're sacrificing because someone's applying something ideally like salazar applies bleed and that increases physical damage in a, a, just a different way it's kind of 
again, a bit unclear how exactly it works. But yeah, everyone's playing other things. So it depends what the trade off is. But ideally, if you can get it without losing too much, then yeah, I think it's, it's definitely worth going for. Yeah, because I found again, like in, in the guild boss in raid, the equivalent, you know, putting a burnout is really effective. Putting poisons out is really effective because it's damage over time or it's like a tick rate of damage. So it's, yeah. you're not only doing like your hits, but you're also kind of, kind of doing extra tick damage as well. So do you kind of like push in towards, it would be great to have a bleed champion. It'd be great to have a burn champion, like all of these different debuffs. Is that something which you're looking for? Or is it more about these specific heroes are just good for guild boss? That's a really, really good question, honestly. It's one that's changed quite a lot lately. So most of the time I've been playing, the meta has been bleed because right. the highest damage dealers in guild boss have been fighters. It's been Salazar, or especially Zilla 2, Salazar and Arrogance. And now we have people using Valeria. She was buffed only a few weeks ago, actually. She wasn't buffed very long ago at all, even on Forerunner. And Valeria is doing such ridiculous damage. Yeah that people are now starting to actually substitute Salazar out. So we're no longer running the bleed teams as much. Oh, okay. But for the longest time, it was like you needed a Salazar. You needed high bleed uptime because it was boosting so much. Uh, just the top left guy up there. If you, yeah, yeah. So no, I, just saw I don't that, yeah. remember the details. Do you mind clicking the first skill and the bleed? I think it was 10% damage. Yeah, 10% physical damage. So it's basically vulnerability 10%, but it will stack with vulnerability. So right, okay. it's odd. But the other thing is all of these fighters doing so much damage and there's a, a really common artifact people built, which was Scarlet Hunt. Yeah. So it increased your damage to bleeding targets. So to that bleed, kind of created yeah, yeah. a meta where we had to have Salazar, we had to apply bleed. We had Scarlet Hunt on so our Zilla to our Arrogance and our Salazar. But now, as you were saying, it's kind of changed more to having the heroes because they just do so much damage. But this is like aiming for 50k blood. So it doesn't affect yeah, yeah. most yeah. people. But yeah, but there's definitely a, a kind of Either you can go for the physical team, go for the bleed kind of fighter team, or you can just kind of go for the raw max damage heroes. But I think if you can synergize around it, it's very good. Yeah. And, and in terms of, I guess, newer players coming in, I know there's a couple of heroes which, which kind of were called out to me very early. So uh, Kook was one in terms of someone that actually applies the poison um, and one to watch out for just because they do good amounts of damage really for very low initial cost and they're very easy to find kind of hero uh, are there others which you would kind of call out as you know what early game these are the type of heroes that you should be looking for quite easy to to obtain yeah i mean kook is definitely really really punching above his weight he, he's very good in gil boss i think i've seen people use him pretty consistently up to nightmare 2 even just yeah. for the max damage stacks, he can actually do quite good. And I think one of the things that's nice about Kook is he's a DPS that isn't gear hungry because it can be quite hard trying to gear all of your DPS in quite nice gear. But if you're progressing, Kook can get quite a nice amount of damage out without having to be six star, without having to have all this gear. He just needs attack speed and to survive, and then he's pretty good. Yeah. So I think, yeah, Kook's a great option. And then beyond Kook, uh, as you're, you were showing yesterday, Wrath is just a ridiculously good option for Guild Boss. Yeah. Everyone gets him on the day 14 login, so a little bit of a wait. But he is really, really nice for Guild Boss. Of course, as the Nightmare Lord for a very attainable faction, but also just as a damage dealer himself. And he gains 15% crit rate as a talent, so it makes yes. him a lot easier to gear, which I think is really nice for a progressing player. Uh, Besides I guess you just... that... Sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say, you just mentioned the kind of Lord bonus here, which was definitely something that had been pointed out to me because I did have a number of people in the Nightmare faction. But um, and obviously you get abomination as well eventually through your fusion, so you can start stacking up this bonus quite quickly. And this is a massive one, so you know just doing up to thirty five percent more attack speed is kind of crazy. But I was just wondering, outside of that, were there any other lords that you particularly say, you know what, this is a great lord to throw into a squad, or a great lord or a great squad to kind of look for because the the lord bonus is so good for guild boss. Yeah, there's, um, there's pr that I'm aware of, there's three main guild boss teams that are, yeah. you're just going to see them. Every, every high level team is going to use one of these three teams or two of these three teams. Uh, Nightmare is the most obvious one that most people run. And then the second most common is Infernal. And Infernal is probably the strongest team, though it depends if, if you've got everything. But it's mainly because of Zilla 2, of course, in the Infernal team. 
and uh, the, then it's the also Infernal Blast, to... you mean, yeah? No? Yeah, Infernal Blast, sorry, yeah, I just referred to them as Infernal. No, no, I yeah, just, this I, is I, a... I was, I'd not recognise the, the two lords, honestly, I've, I've not seen them, but... Um... So yeah, sorry. They are so, uncommon for sure. Painfully uncommon. But uh, right. Pyros and Zillatu is just like a match made in heaven for Guild Boss and of course Twin Fiend if you're lucky enough to get him. There's a, a lot of mechanics behind what makes it such a good pairing. But basically the Infernal Blast faction, their ultimate is both of those lords will channel their focus fire effect. And yeah. while they're the lord, any other Infernal Blast heroes in that faction team will also channel so they stop attacking but all of the damage kind of charges into this attack and when it fires it becomes a gigantic nuke effectively okay nice i've not so, seen this yeah really really good for a guild boss yeah sure and zilla 2 then sort of stands out as one of the highest dps because because of that or just generally one of the highest dps's anyway largely because of that but yeah just generally she's a very very good dps she applies burning, which is nice. In her basic attack, she gains bonus damage if she's blocking, which is kind of weirdly worded again. But if you have her at the front row of Guild Boss, so, so here's a tip for anyone who has Zilla to block targets take 20% more damage. So you want to make sure she's at the front row in Guild Boss. That way she gains 20% more base attack damage. And her ult is a base attack as well. But then okay, the so other things that, that make her good fighter. are her, her yeah. two passives. So, as you can see, when she's not attacking, she gains these stacks, increasing her damage. So, while yeah. she's channeling with a Infernal Blast Lord, oh, okay. it's actually building those stacks. Yeah, yeah. And Crazy. then the true damage, I'm not sure. I think this applies to Guild Boss because his health is always kind of full anyway. Yeah, so true damage, basically, I guess <laughs> this says to me that she's ignoring resistances completely. I would agree, but I, I haven't. I, shamefully, I haven't tested it, but I believe so. The wording <laughs> is so jank in these things. It's, yeah, it's like, yeah. I think Nocturne says he does real damage. So there's there's real damage <laughs> and there's true damage, whatever that right. means. Yeah, I guess this is the type of thing. Like over over time, the more people that play test and get into the game, the more the more we kind of get to understand what some of this stuff means. Yeah, uh, hopefully. Uh, yeah, I guess honestly, like when I was when we kind of like working through best teams for raid. Back in the day, I mean, it took a long time. Probably took a good couple of years before we really started to understand yeah. uh, what is really strong and, and why it's really strong. Um, I guess one of the other things I was going to ask you, actually, and this is comes back to my kind of one healer, two healer thing. In terms of effective health points or like survivability, now, all I've done so far has just been people have been like, get as much damage into your attack heroes as you can. Like, try and just build them to do to do nukes, right? So. That's pretty much what I did. So I was building that Raph yesterday. It's only five star, but I wasn't really paying attention at all to adding health, adding defense, that type of stuff. And I guess, is there a certain level that you're looking for to be able to survive with one healer? Is it almost like, don't completely neglect it because you've still got to live? From my experience, no. I've not had, but that's, I think maybe the issues with, with these in this case is might just be because they're not six star yet yeah but i find guild bosses damage output even at nightmare four is not super high so i think you can really build people with just pure glass cannon and if you've got one like pretty well geared healer that tends to be good enough i've not once i've actually got everyone six star and i have a healer in, in decent healing gear i've never really had any issue so on this new account i did use vortex and midan for a while together yeah. the same way that you are um but once i eventually got them to six star then i was able to swap down to i think i just used vortex for a while because he's got a better healing range yeah but yeah I, you don't need to worry about hp and defense on dps in basically any content unless you're really trying to min max over a stage in gear raid 2 some people swap stuff about but for guild boss i, I don't think you need to worry about it. It, it you just focus on the healers pretty much okay and uh, i guess I'm, I'm kind of going a bit random with questions here but i'm going to go for right. it anyway um Things like healing effect, is that literally just how well your healers heal or is that the healing you receive? Um, yeah. And, so... and should you care about this? This is a stat versus like their main healing stat. It's, um, again, a, a very unclear formula, but um, <laughs> when, <laughs> when, when you heal a target, you heal them for 5% of their max HP multiplied by a value determined by your healing effect 
Right. And then that is added to your healing stat. So for Vortex HP, again, multiplied by a value determined by his healing effect. So those yeah. kind of values are combined together. And then there's another multiplier based on your healer type. But basically, healing effect is affecting both sides. It's affecting the scaling off of the target's max HP and the scaling off of your healing stat. So healing effect is actually very nice, but obviously it needs something to scale off. It doesn't actually add healing by itself. It's a, like a multiplier. Yeah. So you need to balance it, basically, is I, I think the, the, the simple answer. So either two healing effect mains and one main of your whatever your healing stat is or two of your main healing stat and one healing effect main that tends to work out okay but for someone like vortex i actually do the same as you i like to just put hp on them because i yeah. use them in gear raid 2 and i find that him surviving in gear raid 2 tends to take a bit of priority over getting slightly bigger heals out sure so Fine. for gearing him i focus hp and then i try to mix healing effects and attack speed on a hp scaling healer but generally yeah. you do want to focus healing effect quite a bit Okay. And, and then, so we've talked about, in terms of damage, we're saying glass cannon damage, healing, ideally, ideally you have an HP-based healer, and ideally um, you just pump HP with some healing effect. Are you worried about things like attack speed? Does, does any of that, are yeah, they the sort of stats you're looking for as well? Like, I, I guess, I guess, I guess for me, for. I was like, when I was gearing people, I was like, what's my main, call it three stats per role that I'm looking for is... is I think would that's be helpful. That's definitely it, yeah. Yeah. Definitely those three. Healing effect, attack speed, and whatever they scale on. I think for attack scaling healers, because they're not being used in gear raid 2 as much, I tend to focus more on healing effects and attack speed on these guys than I do on HP healers. But I do use Vortex for a lot of content. And I use him extensively in gear raid 2 in situations yeah. where he's taking a beating. So I sure. beat my, build my very tanky, very high HP. But generally with a healer, you do want to kind of balance your distribution of, a, of attack or HP and healing effect and then pick up ideally around 100 attack speed plus. But obviously that depends what game stage you're at, how much you can yeah. you know, yeah. do that. And, and with, so with damage dealers, you're saying glass cannon, but obviously what I'm learning is attack is worth a lot more than, than trying to like push 100% crit super early. Um, maybe yeah. that changes a bit as you go to late game when you get better gear and you definitely want to try and crit more but again like main main things you're looking for here is attack speed something that you prioritize is it just kind of like focus all out attack and then find the other substats if you can you know what's what's the, the vibe here yeah so it's 10 we tend it obviously depends on your ga gear stage but yeah at the end game or when you're trying to push to the end game we aim for 200 percent of your attack as bonus so the green value being double the white value is like a, a rough ballpark figure Okay. And we push for crit rate to 100%. Uh, it's fine if it's 150% on the green value, but you really want it to be more than 100, and ideally around 150 to 200, just to help you get over the resistance of the enemies. And then yeah. we push crit rate to 90 to 100%, and then we focus crit damage. But I think I tend to prioritize crit damage similarly to attack speed because attack speed really the first 100 bonus of attack speed really goes a long way because obviously it's a curve so you want to make the most of the earlier scaling because it's so beneficial so yeah i i would probably go attack as my first priority crit rate as my second and then for third i kind of juggle between attack speed and crit damage if i found that the gear gets me a nice amount of attack speed then I can you know, start to focus on crit damage. If I've already got a decent amount of crit damage, I focus on the other. I guess I just try and keep them up, you know, not neglect one if I can, but yeah. it can be quite tricky. And, and somewhere like Guild Boss, where we, we all take damage, right? So we're, we're yeah. all going to be hit. Is, is Rage Regen a priority at that point? Because you're thinking, well, we're definitely going to take the damage to get the, the ults off. Or is it because you're literally just going to ult when... The shield goes up that is almost irrelevant anyway yeah that's uh, honestly that's a very good question it's one that's been kind of tweaked a lot lately as people are now pushing for much higher in guild boss so i think rage regen in guild boss tends to come down to more min maxing especially at the end game so yeah rage regen will help nudge the cooldown of your ultimates by a couple of seconds maybe a few seconds over guild boss because you get hit more regularly so in a lot of content, a few seconds difference won't mean a massive amount. But in Guild Boss, because your timings can be quite tight, if you can, and this is why I say it's more min-maxing endgame, if you can line it up so that your Dolores comes up at the same time that your 
Valeria does or your Wrath automatically activating his ultimate. So you line it up so that you can always have Dolores boost with Wrath. That's yeah. how people would tend to push things now. But while progressing, you kind of want to absolutely make sure that you're ulting for every single shield where later on you yeah. can kind of, you know, you can be a bit off and it will be fine because you have so much damage. Sure. So, yeah, I think Rage Regen is, is very, very good, but it tends to be when you're optimizing things and you're really pushing tight time frames. Yeah. Uh, what I have noticed is I mean, it's not because of his Rage Regen, but my Ajax just gets his ult back super quick compared to everyone else. I guess that's... Is that just a stat that I should be looking out for, uh, actually? His, is that... I, don't, I have never had an Ajax. I'm not fortunate All right, okay. Can you show his skill? I just want to see his ult's uh, Rage Cap. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. 800 is, is quite short. Really. It's not, like, super short, but it's fairly short. So I'm with his rage regen. I think, yeah, it would be coming up fairly quick. Oh, that would make some sense because my Setram is like, where's <laughs> <Yeah>. your ult? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, yeah, he's a beast cake, sense. but he okay. takes a while. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, look, I, I mean, I feel like we've bounced a around a lot of topics there. Is there anything which we haven't covered that you'd say, you know what, you absolutely should know this for, for Guild Boss at this point? Is there anything we've not kind of talked through? Yeah, I think, I think the general rule of thumb is trying to use a Dolores if, you, if, you, if you're fortunate enough to have a Dolores, making sure you're optimizing all of the attack tiles. If you don't have a Dolores, or even if you do, one of the other most important things is healer coverage. So as we've already kind of gone over it loosely, but just to kind yeah. of rehash it, you want to make sure everyone's covered with a healer, bar none pretty much, unless you have someone who's really good at self-sustain, like an A5 Wrath, then maybe you can yeah. get away with it. But ideally the healer is a rage restoring healer. So someone like Hollow or Elowin is very ideal. And then aside from that, try to synergize your teams so that you can use your ults on the shield to pop the shields for sure. And if you're unable to break the shield, then just restart the run and do everything before the shield just to get your blood count as high as possible. If you're not going to break the shield, then do that. And there's, there's ways to cheat it to get around it if you're not going to break the shield, taking like a Decimus, for example, so that he yes. takes the hit and then you bring everyone back. There's a bunch of cheese. But yeah, generally speaking... You want to just go as much damage as possible, and it's on the healers to keep everyone else alive. So I, th sure. I think and that's kind of the, the general basics of Guild Boss. And I don't, just got one other question. So if you could two, two key a higher level versus one key in your current level, and I, I guess let's say you've got Harder Nightmare versus Nightmare 2, would you take two all chests at like harder nightmare or would you put two keys into nightmare two to get the one better chest there so my rule of thumb has always been i do one key on something i can 100 percent, and then my second key is always a progression attack just okay so i can always see how my team's improving yeah because some people will just stick to the two things they can 100% in one attack, but then you're not really able to find out if you're able to beat the next one. So do the next I wouldn't one, yeah. two key the same one because you're getting less like overall rewards, but I would tend to one, one on 100% and one on a progression attack. Yeah, makes sense. Cool. Well, uh, I, I mean, we've gone over half an hour, so we, we really got to cut this off. I feel like a chat all day. Um, <laughs> I guess, it's an uh, absolute pleasure. Jorge. Thanks so much. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on. Thanks for kind of sharing uh, a load of your knowledge. And for those who um, don't already subscribe to my bucket, we're going to put links down below. We've also got a collab on his channel. So come and check that one out as well. Um, but yeah, guys, thanks so much for watching. My bucket, thanks for joining me. Thank you very much, mate. It's been a pleasure.